Hi, this talk is about the brain stem. So the part of the brain stem first, here you have a sagittal section of a dog's head, where you see the encephalon right here with the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brain stem, a continuous as the spinal cord. So now we will focus in these two images. And I have marked in colors the different parts of the brain stem. First, in red is the diencephalon. Then we have in green, the mesencephalon. In yellow, the pons. And in blue, the medulla oblongata. There you have a dorsal view of the brain stem. What are the functions of the brain stem? There are many. They control the cranial nerves. It serves as a pathway for ascending and descending vias from the spinal cord to upper centers and from upper centers to the spinal cord. It fights against gravity. It initiates movements that are not particularly skilled and regulates vital functions and activates the cerebrum through the ascending reticular activating system. Let's have a look at this video. In this video, I have put an encephalon inside the cranial cavity and we are going to make transverse sections. In the first, we do not see the brain stem yet, but we identify structures that we know as the cord nuclei, telencephalic septum, corpus callosum, white matter. This is the fibers, projection fibers, the internal capsule. And also we identify down here the optic nerves the cingulate gyrus, one and the other. We see fibers that are going to become the rostral commissure. Here we still see the optic nerves very close to the optic chiasm. Here, the cella torsica with the dorsum cellae that holds the hypothesis. Look how the dorsum cellae, cellae is introducing between the cruz cerebri of the mesencephalon. Here we have the pons and the medulla oblongata. Okay, easy to identify structures. Okay, second section. This section is being done at the level of the hypothesis, you see, forms path or part of the hypothalamus. <coughs> we see both thalami joined by the interthalamic adhesion. Yeah. This is part of the fornix, hippocampal formation there, and here. Next section. This session was done 
at the level of the dorsum cellae. So we see the mesencephalon here, okay, with the hippocampus. The other, as you see, there is limbic cortex, part of the thalamus, of the geniculate bodies of the thalamus, the mesencephalic aqueduct, the rostral colliculi. This is the corpus callosum, and here part of the fibers that get out from the hippocampus. And particularly, we are very close to the splenium of the corpus callosum, the cruz cerebri, that form the ventral portions of the cerebral peduncles. Look. This is interesting, this video, because it shows you that the brain stem is located occupying the middle fossa, the caudal fossa, okay? But there is a lot of space in front of the brain stem here. In the next section, we have cut at the level of the caudal colliculi of the mesencephalon. We see the vermis of the cerebellum and we see pons here. As you see, this is located in the caudal fossa of the cranial cavity. Now we have removed the cerebral hemispheres and in the next section we are cutting medulla oblongata right here. We will study these structures later on. Part of the vermis, cere cerebella hemispheres. Look that most uh, the, the brain stem is located quite caudally. Well we have here the diencephalon, but caudal to the cella turcica, we have mesencephalon, pons, medulla, oblongata. The pyramids. Now, for the next section, we are cutting metalla oblongata. You see, this is the accessory nerve. We will study this nerve later on in another talk. We are at the level of the obix here. Okay. So now you have the idea where the brain stem is located in the cranial cavity. Let's study the parts. The first one is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is formed by the epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and methothalamus. Look that all this, is, uh, there is one structure that is, uh, it is not in the middle, but somehow there, and all the rest of the uh, parts of the diencephalon take their name according to their position to the thalamus. Thalamus meaning internal ch chamber. Okay. So thalamus, remember that there are two thalamus. Okay. One right and one left. And they are united by the interthalamic adhesion. So it's a pair structure. However, the hypothalamus is not pair, but the thalamus is a pair structure, okay? Let's start with the epithalamus. Oh, well, the thalamus, better. And we will, from there, we will go to other parts, the thalamus. The thalamus, both thalami are quite big structures and full of elevations, 
that correspond to nuclei. Here, this is a dissection of a brain stem. I have removed the cerebral hemispheres. So here you have the optic nerves with the optic chiasm and the optic tract tract that runs up up to the lateral geniculate body of the thalamus and medially and more ventrally located is the medial geniculate body. On a rostral view we identify other structures, the columns of the fornix there, the rostral commissure right and the columns of the fornix running caudal to the rostral commissure. This elevation here corresponds to the rostral nucleus. On a dorsal vision, we see the left thalamus and the right thalamus, uh, right? And this is the third ventricle. The rostral nucleus is this nucleus here, the lateral dorsal nucleus, the lateral caudal nucleus, the lateral geniculate body and momentarily you have the on the caudal position the pulvinar that means in from latin pillow the dorsomedial nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus okay if we open carefully both uh, thalami we identify the interthalamic invasion here here we are at the level of the third ventricle. Now let's try to identify these nuclei through sections, through transverse sections. At this level here that is marked on this image, on the superior left image, we have cut and we identify the interthalamic adhesion. This is hypothalamus with the mammillary bodies right here. Here in white, we have part of the columns of the fornix and the mammillothalamic tract here. And we identify there is a collection of cells, of somats, of bodies of cells here, that is the paraventricular nucleus. We also identify dorsal here, the dorsal medial nucleus, the lateral dorsal nucleus. Here we have the ventral rostral nucleus. This nucleus cannot be identified from outside because it's hidden. And more laterally located, it is re the reticular nucleus. All these nuclei receive different information from different parts of the central nervous system. If we make a transverse section a bit more caudal, we identify the lateral dorsal nucleus Dorsal medial, we see the paraventricular nucleus. Again, the interthalamic adhesion and the lateral ventral nucleus. And the structures we have identified previously. And also the reticular nucleus. We are more caudal now. We are at the level of the methothalamus. The methothalamus is the part of the thalamus that is formed by the lateral geniculate bodies and the medial geniculate bodies. Okay, we have the lateral geniculate body is this structure here and it seems to be divided into portions because all these fibers, white fibers, belong to the optic radiation. Okay, the fibers that leave the lateral geniculate body in order to form part of the of the inter, of the internal capsule and they reach the occipital cortex here we have the medial geniculate body this is the lateral and there we have more ventrally the medial medial geniculate body and this white matter here is the acoustic radiation fibers that from this nucleus they reach the temporal cortex. And again, this we have the ventral, ventral caudal nucleus. These are other views of the thalamus. And as you see, the lateral geniculate body, it's, it's connected with the rostral colliculus of the mesencephalon through the brachium of the rostral colliculus. 
as well, the medial geniculate body is connected with the caudal, with the caudal colliculus of the mesencephalon through the brachium of the caudal colliculus. Look at the arrows. It means this arrow means that this arrow goes from the lateral geniculate body to the rostral colliculus because the information first has, has reached the lateral geniculate body through the optic tract. And some fibers go to the cortex, but to the fibers for reflexes, for turning the head towards a visual stimulus, these fibers reach the rostral colliculus of the mesencephalon. From there, the tectospinal tract will send information to cervical spinal segments in order to turn the head towards this visual stimulus. So this is the direction of the fibers. However, here we have pointed the arrow rostrally. It means that the caudal colliculus is involved in auditory, auditory reflexes. So fibers from the caudal colliculus are going to go down forming part of the tectospinal tract in order to reach cervical spinal segments for a turning of the head towards an auditory stimulus. So in this case, these fibers that have to be conscious, they have to proceed rosally and reach the medial geniculate body through the brachium of the caudal colliculus in order to be projected to the temporal cortex following the acoustic radiation. So again, this is a fixed encephalon of a dog. And then you see here, this structure is this one here, is the lateral geniculate body. And as you see, fibers of the optic radiation. And then the medial geniculate body with fibers of the acoustic radiation. So when we identify lesions in the brain stem affecting the thalamus, if we know which nuclei could be affected, we may have clues. However, it is not easy, right? So in this case, the lesion may affect the reticular nucleus and the ventral lateral nucleus. So this lesion here, this lacunar lesion here, it affects what? It affects this area. This area is comprised a bit more ventromedial to the lateral geniculate nucleus. So maybe affecting the ventral caudal nucleus. So this is another as a bigger lesion, right? And in this case, it is affecting, well, a lot of nuclei from the dorsomedial nucleus, ventral lateral and paraventricular paraventricular nucleus. In this case here on the right, you, have, you, you are cutting the brain stem at the level of the mesothalamus. So we are at the lateral and medial geniculate bodies. So, and also a bit more ventral. So this portion of the ventral caudal nucleus may be damaged and also part of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So what's a thalamus? A thalamus, it could be as a big train station that all the trains that are taking information from different parts of the body, they have to stop here in order to reach the sensory cortex. So what is going to happen when there is a lesion of the thalamus? So we may be wrong, it's like waiting in here at this end station and we see that the, the trains that should be coming this way, they are not coming. So we first think that something must be wrong at the origin of the line. But no, the problem is at the thalamus, at this uh, train station like, like. So it's a way of looking at the thalamus, a very easy one. So now we go to the epithalamus that is on top of the thalamus. What the structures are, sorry about that, what the structures are on top of the thalamus? We have the pineal gland, 
Okay? The abenula, what is the abenula? Abenula means restraints. And this is a structure. Okay, here we have the dorsal view of the brain stem. This is a transverse section at this level. So here and then this square has been enlarged. In order to identify, look, this is the abenula. What do we have caudally here? We have the caudal commissure that has been sectioned. Remember the caudal commissure is related with the fibers of the optic tract. Under the caudal commissure, we have the subcommissural organ. This is a circumventricular organ, secretory circum circumventricular organ. And the abenula. And the abenula is connected with here, you see the abenula in this section here, you see the abenula. And this fasciculus, there's the abenulo intercrural tract, also known as fasciculus retroflexus of Maynard. This fasciculus connects the abenula with the intercrural nucleus of the mesencephalon. And also the abenula is connected through the stria abenularis thalami. This way here, this pathway connects the abenula rosally, located here, dorsal to the third ventricle. This is the third ventricle or the diencephalic ventricle and connects it with the telencephalic septum. Here you have a summary of all the pathways that form the limbic system. Okay, and so we have seen that the abenula is connected through the stria abenularis with the septum and the accumbens nucleus. This is a basal nucleus. Okay, remember as well as the hippocampus is connected through the fornix with the septum, the accumbens, and the mammillary body. And also we have the stria terminalis that connects the amygdala. We have seen the amygdala that was enclosed where? Inside the piriform lobe, remember, from another lecture. It connects the amygdala with the septum, telencephalic septum, the accumbens, and the mammillary body. However, the stria terminalis is connected a bit laterally to the thalamus at this weight here. Okay, this is thalamus and this is a venula. So it's lateral to the thalamus, the estria terminalis. Okay. So we get to the pineal gland. That means like a pine tree or epiphysis cerebri. Remember that René Descartes thought that uh, the pineal gland was a, a valve for a connection between the, our soul that was in the brain and the surrounding media. There was a kind of connection, right? And has been studied in esoteric uh, sciences. However, if we look in anatomy, this is the pineal gland like a pine of a dog. You see, this is the third ventricle, one thalamus, the other thalamus, the rostral colliculus of the mesencephalon and the caudal colliculus and the other one, caudal colliculus of the mesencephalon. And here we have the pineal gland. In the case of a bobine, it's much bigger. What is the pineal gland? The pineal gland is a gland that produces as it rich, is rich, it very, uh, is very vascularized, right? And also is very well innervated by sympathetic nerve fibers. So the pineal gland produces a lot of hormones. However, one of them is the uh, serotonin that is going to be transformed in melatonin. And in this case, the light inhibits the production or the transformation of serotonin and melatonin. So in the conditions of darkness, we have more melatonin, so we have sleepness and is an antigon antigonadotrophic activity and restrains sexual development. Okay, so it's a so this pineal gland has to be connected with the light. Here you have the pineal gland of a ship. Look at it; it's very very big. We have the rostral colliculi, <coughs> the left, the right, the cerebellum, right here. 
we have opened the corpus callosum right here, the fornix, in order to identify the, the, the most dorsal portions of the brain stem. And you see the pineal gland, and these connections is the stria abenularis. Yeah. Look how big is the pineal gland in a sheep. And also you identify other structures. This is the hippocampus here, part of the fornix, hippocampus again, right? Is a limbic because it's in the border of the brain stem. As you see, in the border of the brain stem. So, as in birds, it seems that the light and, and small vertebrates, the light goes directly through the, um, through the roof of the cranial cavity to the pineal gland. However, in mammals, this light comes from the eye, runs with the optic nerve with the optic nerve up to the optic chiasm optic tract and then reaches the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus from there it is not very well established how it reaches cervical spinal segments t1 up to t4 to the intermediate gray substance that are sympathetic so preganglionic neurons reach the cranial cervical ganglion and from there they enter the cranial cavity and they reach, they innervate the pineal gland. Let's go to the subthalamus. Okay, the subthalamus is formed by two portions, the subthalamic body and the zona inserta. Okay, where is the subthalamus located? Look, this is this is a transverse section of a brain stock. You see both thalami, the interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus here. So part of the hypothalamus is located here with the cruz cerebri, the optic tract located there. You remember the hippocampal formation, okay? And then you see, well, this is the abenula here, the fasciculo retroflexus, you know many things now. So now this structure here is the subthalamic body and the zona inserta that extends dorsally to the cruz cerebri. Do not, uh, do not me be wrong with these portions. These are tracts, right? Remember that we are in a Balchowski. So we see the more brownish is fibers, uh, fibers, okay? The mamillotegmental tract and the cerebello rubro thalamic tract located here okay and the subthalamus as we have seen previously in other lessons it's very important for the movements to control movements and posture and we will see la, that in another lessons how important is the subthalamus let's go with the hypothalamus hypothalamus means everything under the thalamus okay and we have, of course, nuclei, okay? But other structures that shouldn't be forgotten that they belong to the hypothalamus. And here we have the optic, the optic chiasm. As you see, the optic chiasm, this is a ventral view, okay? Optic nerves, optic nerves, optic chiasm. The optic tract forms part of the hypothalamus as well. The mammillary bodies right here, Remember, they receive the columns of the fornix. We have the tuber sinirium. This is a gray matter elevation, right? And the infundibulum, okay? Infundibulum means a fun, okay? It's a part of the neurohypothesis. So in this image is an MRI in a sagittal section. You see here the optic chiasm the hypothesis, right? So everything here is hypothalamus, okay? The jugum is phenoidale here, and then you have the optic nerves and the optic chiasm. And in this image, again, you see the optic nerve, hypothalamic nuclei, and inside the cella turcica, the hypothesis, okay? What it means, hypothesis? Hypo is under, physis is to grow. So uh, anything that grows under, okay? Andreas Vesalius 
thaw, it was the uh, site to produce mucosity. This is why it is also named pituitary gland from pituita. Then you have a ventral view of the encephalon with some of the cranial nerves, the eyes, the optic nerves, the optic chiasm, and here behind the optic chiasm, there we have the hypothesis, surrounded by cranial nerves. We will see that, okay? So here we have the tuber sinereum, part of the hypothesis, uh, sorry, part of the hypothalamus, the optic chiasm, part of the hypothalamus, the, in, the beginning of the optic tract, part of the hypothalamus and the hypothesis. So this, <coughs> sorry, this tuber sinereum is an elevated area that gives rise to the neurohypothesis, one of the parts of the hypothesis, the neurohypothesis. This neurohypothesis is consists, is formed by an infundibulum, a film-shaped structure, and a neural lobe, right? So on a transverse section on MRI, you see the basis phenoid here, and this hyperintense signal corresponds to the hypothesis. This is a mid-plane section where you see the interthalamic adhesion right here, the mesencephalic aqueduct, the third ventricle right here, the columns of the fornix, the rostral commissure, the optic chiasm, and the mammillary bodies. This is one of the mammillary bodies. There are two, one on each side is a pair structure. And then we have the hypothesis here with this funnel shaped structure named infundibulum. So now in a video, you have a better view of the hypothesis. This is the hypothesis right here. These are vessels of the encephalon we'll talk about in the next lesson. Okay. This is the hypothesis. Through this uh, sulcus enters the diaphragma cellae. Okay, is a structure of uh, dura mater. Okay, diaphragma cellae. So this is the aspect of the hypothesis in a dissection. It's very difficult to remove the encephalon with a hypothesis because it used to be attached. Okay, this is the image of the floor of the cranial cavity. The optic nerves right here, the internal carotid arteries, some cranial nerves. This one in particular is the oculomotor, right? So we see here, this is the cella torsica, the dorsum cellae, and you see inside the cella torsica, the hypothesis. However, as you identify, there are different colors. This part, more brownish, corresponds to the neurohypothesis, that is the smaller portion. And this one that is more clear is the adenohypothesis. Once the hypothesis is removed, is removed, we see the, this uh, dotted line marks the diaphragma cellae, that is a part of the inner layer of the dura mater. So on the transverse section again, the interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus, right? And here you have two portions, the neurohypothesis and on top the adenohypothesis. And if we make a mid-plane section, we identify the mammillary bodies, caudally located, always caudally located to the hypothesis. And then this is the tuber sinereum, this gray matter elevation that gives rise to the infundibulum, right? Also named median eminence. This is important to know the names because sometimes in the papers there appear these names. So remember, this median eminence is the base, the most uh, proximal portion of the infundibulum. And then continues and forms the neural lobe, right? The neurohypothesis. And on top sits the adenohypothesis. Sometimes we may find find a cavity 
is the Kabum hypothesis. This is the remnant of the Radkes Bursa that originated. So you know that the adenoid hypothesis originated from the roof of the oral cavity that forms the Radkes Bursa. So the touches and attaches to the neuro hypothesis. Okay, this is the adeno hypothesis. So while we are removing an encephalon from the cranial cavity, we identify the optic nerves, right? The hypothesis, which part of the hypothesis is this one? The adeno hypothesis, because you know, the adeno hypothesis is the most ventral portion, right? And the pods, etc. And then you have here the dorsum celli, and the, the, the cella torsica and the dorsum celli. And this elevation of Juramata is the diaphragma celli. Look how close uh, is the, the hypothesis to the optic chiasm and to the internal carotid arteries. Again, here we are going to this encephalon was removed with part of the Jura. So we remove this part of the Jura that forms the diaphragma celli, and then we found the adeno hypothesis. And then as we move the adeno hypothesis with the forceps, we identify this is the tuber cyanerium, right? And then we have the also, it is known as the pituitary stalk, right? This pituitary stalk, or also named infundibulum, remember that this, this uh, the, is a part, okay? Is, is a funeral shaped structure that enters the hypothesis and it is surrounded by the neuro hypothesis. Okay. All right. Right. This is a video where we, you see this is the floor of the cranial cavity, right? With the optic nerves, the internal carotid arteries, cranial nerves, and this is the inner layer of the dura mater. And as you see, there are different colors. You have this color here that is in the middle, that is, seems to be more green. It is the adeno hypothesis with the, this hole is part of the infundibulum, right? And then on the outside, this more brown color is the adeno hypothesis. And we are going to remove it. And as you see, the diaphragma cella is quite soft. Even though this cranium was, or this head was fixed before dissection. Sometimes there are other answers, right? And it's difficult to remove it in a dissection. It used to break. Or the touches from the rest of the brain stem. Okay. There you have it, we are removing it. Okay, we are going to run fast and you see the other answers here. All right, so we have removed the hypothesis from the cella torsica. Again, important, this region is very, very important. Okay, again, what do we have here? We have the diaphragma celli, this extension of inner layer of the dura mater, right? And the internal carotid artery, the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the abducen, and also we should have marked here the trigeminal nerve, okay? So, an important uh, thing to remember is that the, uh, the, the hypothesis is not surrounded by the leptomeninges. Very, very important. It is just surrounded by dura mater, not leptomeninges. And as you can see here, this is an enlarged area. You see all the vessels running in the superarachnoid space. The internal carotid artery that has to go through these leptomeninges in order to enter the, or to enter the brain, right? It got, it, because this internal carotid artery comes from outside, okay? And has to enter this, this superarachnoid space, has to go down, right? Remember that the 
Hypof hypothesis is not surrounded by leptomeninges. And here again, we are going to do is to remove the hypothesis. And as we cut it through the infundibulum, we see the third ventricle inside. And then, as you can see, we can move the arachnoid from the pia mata. And this is the superarachnoid space where all the vessels are located. So going about this uh, diaphragma cellai, what is that? Remember here in this drawing, I have marked you the hypothesis and the rest of the hypothalamus on top. On both sides, we have the cavernous sinus and many other structures. So the para this is the paracella region with all the cranial nerves invaginating this dura mata inside or very in in relation with the cavernous sinus, also vessels, the internal carotid artery in this case. Okay, this represents a medial plane section. Okay, and as you see in red is the pia mata, in green is the arachnoid, and as you see the leptomeninges do not cover the hypothesis. Even though part of this uh, um, internal layer, this pia mata, uh, also runs on top of the neurohypothesis. Why so? Because the neurohypothesis develops from the neural tube, not the adenohypothesis that is coming from the Radke's bursa, right? And in blue, we have the jura mata. As you see, the jura mata, you know, is divided into layers, an inner and an outer layer. The outer layer is the periosteal layer. And then here, the inner and the outer layers split, right? And the inner layer forms the diaphragma cellae. And the outer layer remains attached to the bone. And sometimes there are adherences. This is why sometimes it's difficult to remove the hypothesis without breaking it through the pituitary stalk. And in this space between the, these two layers of chiramata, there are veins that are going to receive the hormones. All right, again, we go to the dissection room and we make a mid-plane section, right? You see the presphenoid, basiosphenoid bone, basiooccipital bone, right? You identify the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the brain stem here. We will focus here in this area. We see the... Um, this is the dorsum cellae, right? Remember that this uh, head has been dehydrated. So the spaces are much bigger, right? And as you see, the jura mata and the superarachnoid space and this space between the two layers of jura is bigger than it should be right here to remember, okay? And then you see this, the hypothesis located here and very close to the here we have the mammillary bodies and the optic chiasm, right? Okay. So, again, you know that you identify usually the hypothesis on MRIs. This is a T1 enhanced and T2 enhanced sequences. So, here we are, and we, when we want to identify the hypothesis, we have to cut at the level of the round foramen. Here is the alar canal, right? Here is the alar canal. This is an enlarged, enlarged image here, and T1 and T2. And you see this, this is hyperintense signal corresponds to the hypothesis. This is the basi esphenoid bone. In T2, we do not see hyperintense signal. And also what we identify is the CSF in the superarachnoid space. This is the CSF in the superarachnoid space because the superarachnoid space is located dorsally, right? Not, you remember, the hypothesis is out from the superarachnoid space. It's not inside. It's not covered by the leptomeninges. So it means that there is not CSF around the hypothesis. Okay? So the thing is sometimes why it is bright. Why is hyper intense? It depends, it could be the anterior or a pituitary lobe or adenohypothesis or the posterior, depending. 
So in the case of uh, T1, it could be the hyperintensity of intracellular proteins, concentration of proteins. Sometimes in a liver disease is the presence of circulating manganese. Or in the case of neurohypothesis, the storage of vasopressin in the posterior or in the pituitary lobe or neurohypothesis. This is due that the, because this hormone bounds to a macroproteic structure. And this, why, this is why this macroproteic structure shortens T1 signal and it's bright. So when you see hyperintense, could be the adenohypothesis or the neurohypothesis. In the case of a cat, it's quite similar. Okay. You see, then, is a dorsal section, right? These are the piriform lobes. And then you see the hypothesis. Then you see the hypothesis located. But remember, the hypothesis is part of the hypothalamus. Thank you very much.